It was perhaps the biggest art heist of all time. Countless millions of dollars of the finest European art simply seized by the Nazis. Picassos, Rembrandts, Titians, along with precious family silver and gold taken by the Nazis from museums and private collections as their army advanced relentlessly across Europe. Among the booty was one of the most extraordinary paintings of the 20th century, owned by a wealthy Jewish industrialist. It was a portrait of a woman by Austrian artist Gustav Klimt. For 60 years, the painting's owners fought to get it back. They were hoping I'd die. I mean, I was old enough that they felt, and then it's finished. The battle took them to the American Supreme Court. It's a story of mystery, corruption, and double dealing. Could they possibly fight a nation and win? Vienna at the beginning of the 20th century was a thriving metropolis that had become the cultural center of Austria and home to the rich and famous. It housed one of the world's greatest art galleries, boasted a world-class orchestra, and was full of beautiful buildings and aristocratic mansions. The city's famous coffee houses were teeming with intellectuals, artists, and musicians such as Sigmund Freud, Egon Schiele, and Arnold Schoenberg and the man Viennese society flocked to for their portraits was Gustav Klimt. Klimt was already at his lifetime so highly paid, so there was no other painter in, in, in Austria who could uh, demand such prizes. And if you look at the f female portraits, who were these, these persons? They were all coming from the upper class. They were. Uh, wives of industrialists, of, uh, of academic professors. So uh, they really came from a very wealthy background. One person who could easily afford Klimt's prices was Ferdinand Blochbauer, who had amassed a significant collection of Austrian art. The Viennese had a sweet tooth, and he made his fortune by refining sugar. His wife, Adele, became a socialite who organized parties for Vienna's finest at their mansion. Her niece, Maria, was nine years old at the time. She surrounded herself with artists, composers. She had what they called a salon at the time. She had all these fabulous people, Richard Strauss and Wassermann. I mean, she had people, painters, poets, composers. And this is where she got her intellectual stimulation. Klimt was one of the artists who frequented the salon. He became a personal friend. But what would he charge to paint Adele's portrait? The price at that time was already extremely high. It was enormous. I think that it was as high as you could have acquired at that time a whole villa, a good land house, even in the suburbs of Indiana. It was that high. It may have been expensive, but Klimt's portrait of Adele would become one of the most famous paintings of the 20th century. This was one of only a handful of paintings from Klimt's famous golden period, in which he produced highly decorative work resembling a jewel box. Here is Adele in the most lavish dress, adorned with glittering jewelry. We know it took Klimt over a year to finalize the painting, and he visited her many times, making over 200 sketches. We know from portraits which he prepared for one year, just the preparation. That's just thinking about how I want to have the posture of this woman. How should, should she, she stand, should she st sit, where should be the arms? And so Klimt really thought about all details and he made sketches of all different postures. I think it makes sense if you think he had really a personal relationship to this woman. He, he made a kind of reference to her. Because of course by meeting so often the person, he gets to know her very well. And it's it said, I mean there are rumors that with some of the sitters, with some of the models, he had even a more close uh, relationship 
maybe some sentimental affairs too. In the paintings of his golden period, Gustav Klimt seems to be capturing the seductive and passionate nature of these women. Many believe that Adele was also the model for The Kiss, one of the most sensual works ever produced. So could Adele have been Klimt's lover? When I asked my mother, did Adele have a relationship with him? She said, how dare you ask such a question? It was an intellectual friendship. But my mother would always say that, even if when she was 100% sure that the people had more than an intellectual friendship. At the time, they had their affairs and didn't discuss it. We know that he had many children, illegitimate children, with women whom he didn't marry, he never was married. But we do not know exactly how many children there are, who were the women. I mean, this is un incredible that such a famous painter had so many liaisons who were just hidden. Whatever the relationship between Adele and the artist, Ferdinand and his wife were delighted with the picture. It wasn't long before the portrait of Adele grasped the imagination of the art establishment. The painting became a centerpiece of Klimt exhibitions. The Bluckbauers wanted more Klimts, and they invested in four of his landscapes painted between 1903 and 1916. In the summer, Klimt loved to escape from his studio and head out to the lakes near Strasbourg. This subject to which Klimt returned time and again held a special fascination for him. I think perhaps it was the combination of the natural geometry of the, the, the lake shore and then the, the buildings rising up, um, but with the, the steep hill behind them pushing forwards. That, held an attraction for him, but also the great natural combination of colours. Walking by the lake shore, he would be fascinated by the effect of light on the trees and flowers. And he was back in the autumn with a more subdued set of colors. Here Klimt takes us his subject to Birch Forest, the innards of a forest in a glade. There was a reflection of perhaps getting deep into nature, being at the very heart of things. In truth, it's a fairly restricted palette. Green representing the lichen climbing up the trees and the leaf canopy, uh, the russet colors, earth colors for the, for the floor, and then the, the lovely silvery colors on the tree trunks. So Adele and Ferdinand's house in Vienna became home to one of the largest private collections of Klimt paintings. Adele's face seems to have inspired Klimt in his golden period. When he abruptly changed style in 1912, Adele was once again the subject he chose to paint. So here we have the second portrait of Adela Blockbauer, commissioned by her husband from Klimt in 1907, when Adela was in her late 20s and shot through this, what is a fairly muted color costume. You have the great blue, cobalt blue sash at her waist and, and fine details, highlights of blue throughout the costume. Another fascinating factor is the, is the Japanese influence all around her. She stands these Japanese tapestries behind. Here with the, the horse and rider themes running across the top, we see probably Klimt using something that was hanging in his studio as a backdrop. For 10 years, the house on Elisabethstrasse teemed with the color of Klimt's paintings. But in January 1925, the household sank into darkness and despair. Adele died of a brain disease at the age of 43. She died so very young. She was only in her early 40s and she was only sick like three days because meningitis is devilish. I mean, it hits you and it kills you. Ferdinand was heartbroken. He left his wife's room in their Viennese home, just as it was when she died. 
I remember her bedroom, which she converted into a memorial room. And he always had beautiful fresh flowers there all year round. And there was nothing but the clean paintings, the, the two portraits and the landscapes. Ferdinand also placed a photograph of Gustav Klimt on her bedside table. Adele seemed clear about what she wanted to happen to her paintings. Her will stated, My wish is to leave my two portraits and four landscapes by Klimt to the Belvedere. The Belvedere was Austria's prestigious national gallery, where all society people wanted their portraits to be admired. This beautiful Baroque building in the heart of Vienna was a favorite meeting place for the rich and famous. But for the moment, at least, the painting remained in the room Ferdinand had left in memory of his wife. As the 1930s wore on, peace in Europe became increasingly fragile. The Nazis had come to power in Germany. Deutschland ist wieder eins geworden. Adolf Hitler, unser geliebter Führer. Hitler's territorial ambitions soon became clear. Ferdinand foresaw Germany's intention to invade Austria and used his wealth to support resistance fighters to protect its borders. But that proved futile. In 1938, Hitler ordered the annexation of Austria and German troops marched into Vienna. Before the Nazis arrived in the Austrian capital, Ferdinand fled to his country mansion across the border in Czechoslovakia, leaving the precious portrait of his wife by Klimt behind, with the rest of his art collection on the walls of his Vienna house. As he left the house for the last time, he would have walked past the Academy of Fine Arts right across the street. The shadow of Hitler hung over this place. The Academy had rejected him in 1907, the very year Klimt was painting the gold portrait of Adele. Hitler may have left Vienna as a failed artist, but in March 1938, he came back in very different circumstances and Viennese Jews grew to fear the knock on the door. They just came and took things, you know. They didn't ask you. They just rang the doorbell and I opened and there they were. They were not in uniform because it was Gestapo, you know, and they didn't wear uniforms. They immediately asked me for my jewelry, which I had just gotten from my uncle for my wedding present. It was Adele's beautiful diamond necklace with uh, the earrings to match, and that went to Mrs. Goering. Hermann Goering was one of the main architects of the Third Reich, an era he believed would produce a thousand glorious years of German achievement. As an aristocrat, he saw music and art as part of this great age. As in most things, the Nazis were very organized about their looting. When they were deciding which countries they were going to invade and what their plans for invasion were, they would send out spies or uh, scouts, if you like, to, to see what collections were worth seizing, so that when they went into the country, when, once they invaded, they would immediately go after those collections. It was a massive operation. These pictures show preparations for a huge exhibition of the looted art the Nazis had taken from all over France. Every work of art was inventoried, it was described, it was photographed, and then displays were put on for some of the, for the main Nazi leaders, for Hitler and for Goering, so that they could take their pick of the best of some of the world's art. 
Um, there were sometimes d disputes between Hitler and Goering as to who was going to get which painting or which sculpture. But there are extraordinary photographs that one can see today of uh, Goering going round these special displays which were put on for him of all this stolen art. They seized every possible kind of collection. They were ready to exploit any work of art that was there. Obviously some of the works of art were not to their taste and they had certain ideological uh, approaches to particular schools of art. Ferdinand owned one of the largest collections of art in Vienna. It ranged from the contemporary Klimt paintings to six works by the 19th century German painter Waldmuller. Ferdinand may have been safe in Czechoslovakia, but his paintings were very vulnerable back in Vienna. Unfortunately for him, Hermann Goering was very fond of Waldmuller's work. Goering was also somebody who, in every country, was particularly voracious to increase his art collection. He was particularly interested in old masters as well. And in fact, he had a, an interesting scheme whereby some of the paintings that the Nazis didn't want, like the Impressionists, um, th when they were seized, he arranged for them to be smuggled out to Switzerland in, the dip in a diplomatic bag, where they would then be swapped for the old master paintings that he particularly wanted. And that was, you would find these extraordinary exchanges whereby you might have something like 23 or 25 Impressionists, you know, Coro, Degas, Matisse, uh, which would be swapped for one old master that the Nazis particularly wanted. The Blockbauer family did not escape the horrors that were destroying Jewish families across Europe. Maria's husband was imprisoned in Dachau concentration camp until the family handed over property to the Nazis. They released him when my brother-in-law signed over the factory to them. And so he was brought home, shaved, and the head was shaved. He, he looked awful. But we managed to escape. We crossed the border with the help of a uh, German farmer who took us into Holland. Having gotten their hands on the Blockbauer's factories, they turned their attention to Ferdinand's art collection. They claimed that Ferdinand owed huge amounts of taxes and sent a Dr. Führer to the house in Elisabethstrasse to organize one of the greatest art heists of the 20th century. Dr. Führer knew Hitler and Goering would want the German paintings by Waldbuller for their private collections but they would have no interest in these decadent klimts. He decided to sell them off. It turned out later on that he was a terrific Nazi. His name was Dr. Führer, and he had years in prison afterwards. He made a deal with the Belvedere, the National Gallery, for the two Adele portraits and the apple tree. And he sold the birch trees to another gallery the houses on the lake, he squirreled away for his own collection. The Belvedere has always claimed ownership of the paintings. It had, after all, bought them from Dr. Führer. Besides, it was the wish of Adele herself, set out in her will. With the Blockbauer Klimts in their possession, they were able to stage one of the largest exhibitions of Klimt's work ever mounted. But there was a problem. How could they display portraits of Jewish women now that the country was under Nazi rule? To give the names of these women would in some ways give lies to the ideology of racial superiority that they were at that time promoting. So they were forced to omit or change the names of the paintings. So the portrait of Adele Blockbauer I became simply known as the Lady in Gold. The three Klimts stayed in the Belvedere until the end of the war. When the Allies took control of Vienna, they rounded up all the looted art. The Klimts in the Belvedere were reunited with the one Dr. Führer had sold to another gallery and the one he kept for himself. The Allies took all five to Munich to be catalogued. I think, you know, one of the questions is what happened to this work, all these works of art at the end of the war, particularly the works of art that were in the hands of the Nazi leaders and quite a lot of them were collected up 
by the Allies at the end of the war. As they were collecting up, they found all these depositories of looted art in Germany and uh, Austria. And they then took them to collecting points where they did, I suppose, the reverse of the process that Germans had done at the beginning, which was they inventoried them, they photographed them, and they uh, established where they had come from, with the help of the Nazi records, of course, and then decided to return them to the countries from which they had been taken. Uh, and those countries were charged with setting up commissions for restitution so that the works of art would then be returned to their rightful owners. The Allies didn't want to do that work themselves. Um, in the case of the Goering collection, when they didn't know where they came from, they were subsequently given to German museums to hold and today there are over a hundred paintings from the Goering collection whose rightful owners have not been established yet. This policy of returning the stolen art back to its country of origin meant all of Ferdinand's klimts were sent back to the Belvedere, to the very people who had bought three of them from the Nazis in the first place. In 1938, the Blockbauers had owned two huge factories, mansions in Vienna, a castle in Czechoslovakia. They had 69 major works of art. By the end of the Nazi period, they had nothing. Ferdinand lived out the final years of his life in Switzerland. He never saw his precious paintings again. He died in 1946. Some years later, Maria and her husband settled in the United States with the little money they had left. Maria started making clothes in her small Los Angeles apartment. As the years went by, she saw the Klimt paintings escalate in value as they became world icons. In the United States during the 70s, uh, Klimt paintings enjoyed a resurgence um, as dorm posters. They were, the Kiss and the Portrait of Adela Block Bauer were hung in American college dorms alongside posters of Che Guevara or Jimi Hendrix or whatever. Somehow he came into vogue into American pop culture. So that painting was recognizable to many Americans. While the Klimts were worth millions, Maria was still trying to make ends meet, selling clothes. But her battle would soon begin to reclaim the family treasure. For 50 years, Maria Altman never gave up hope that one day her family would get back the rare and valuable Klimt paintings stolen by the Nazis. It seemed like she had little chance, but something happened in New York which turned the art establishment on its head. In 1998, the Museum of Modern Art borrowed some works of Egon Schiel from an Austrian gallery. Schiel's heirs claimed the paintings had been looted by the Nazis. After the exhibition, the Scheele works were impounded by the U.S. courts. The Scheele case in New York also raised the profile of this whole issue. It raised also the whole question of museums and what the role of museums had been and what the role of museums was today in this whole process. Many museums in Western Europe, in America, places that weren't occupied, Australia and so on, did acquire, knowingly, usually unknowingly, looted works of art. But up until this whole subject came onto the international agenda, and until there was a conference in Washington organized by the State Department in 1998, museums were quite, and art dealers, were you know, quite freely trading in what may have been a looted work of art. The Shield case suddenly made Maria Altman think it was time to contact a lawyer. Could she challenge the Belvedere's claim to her aunt and uncle's paintings? There never really was an actual proof that these paintings belonged to the Belvedere. And then I called Randy. Maria had known the Schoenberg family all her life. Arnold Schoenberg, the famous composer, had been a part of her aunt's social circle. So she turned to his nephew, the young lawyer, Randy Schoenberg, for his legal advice. 
She called me in September of 1998. I was working in a small office of a large New York-based firm. I looked online, a relatively new activity at that time in 1998, at the Austrian newspapers, which had just become available like that, to see what was going on in, in Austria. So when she called me, I knew exactly what she was talking about, and, th and that's really how it started. Because Randy Schoenberg's family had also suffered under the Nazis, he was prepared to leave his well-paid job in order to help prosecute the case. Randy likes to play the odd game of poker and was prepared to gamble his career to seek justice for Maria. He would take on the case and try to recover the paintings on a no-win, no-fee basis. It was deeply personal because both of his grandfathers uh, were ex-held composers uh, his maternal grandfather lost his parents in the Holocaust. Maria had to flee Austria after the Anschluss uh, when Germany and Hitler invaded Austria. So I would say that for them there, were, there was a lot of deeply personal feeling behind uh, the case as they were proceeding. Gustav Klimt painted Adele Blochbauer in 1907. In her will, written in 1925, Adele stated that her two portraits and four landscapes by Klimt were to be left to the Belvedere, where they would hang alongside Klimt's other portraits of wealthy Viennese women. I think the point uh, at this time was that the Austrian government was of the opinion that the last will of Adele uh, gave uh, the Austrian gallery clear title to the paintings. The Austrian government was convinced the Belvedere did not contain any looted art and opened its archives to prove it. An Austrian journalist, Hubertus Chernin, spent a whole year in these archives researching the looted works of Jewish families. Before he died, he discovered key documents that would transform the chances of Maria Altman recovering her family's paintings. He thought Adele's will wasn't the only relevant document. Bertus Chernin went into archives that had been closed to journalists and began to look at the records. When he was done, he wrote an investigative series for a newspaper in Austria that basically showed that, that the Austrians, even back into the 50s, were not as confident that the will gave them ownership of those paintings, and that they themselves thought that they should have gotten some kind of a signed permission from Ferdinand. Although Adele had left the paintings to the Belvedere, her husband decided to overrule that request. He was the one who had paid for the paintings, and his last will explicitly stated that all previous testaments concerning the Klimt paintings were to be null and void. He just left a will, leaving everything to my sister, me, and my brother. The last letter that exists from my uncle, written to the painter Kokoschka, two days before he died, was, I am told that I might get the, maybe the portraits of my wife sent to me here. So that was the last letter of my uncle. In 1999, Austria's Minister of Culture and Education, Elisabeth Goerer, took control and immediately closed the archives. Instead, she announced that she was setting up a government committee to rule on the ownership of the Klimt paintings. We had a conservative government, right-wing, government and uh, she was um, a member of the Conservative Party. She's not in power anymore. She wasn't the most popular um, person in the government and a lot of her decisions have been doubted. So the Klimt case didn't help either to rise her popularity. Minister Goerer and her committee became a real thorn in Randy and Maria's side. The committee wouldn't even look at their evidence. I begged them to come and, and be able to speak to them on Maria's behalf, and I was told, no, we've decided not to speak to any outside people. And they, they considered Maria and her attorney to be a, uh, an outside figure in, in the case concerning her family's paintings, which I thought was remarkable. So we tried to influence this, this committee that was meeting and going to decide uh, what would happen with the paintings, but to no avail. And then at the end of June of 1999, that committee recommended against 
returning the Klim paintings. They were hoping I'd die. I mean, I was old enough that they felt, and then it's finished. But I didn't do them that favor. Minister Guerra actually wrote a public letter that was published in the newspaper. And I'm quoting her now. These paintings were not robbed during the war, and therefore they don't come under the new law. It's compl- completely false. And I think she was just completely ignorant of the facts of the case, willfully ignorant, uh, as I think many Austrians sometimes are of the, the Nazi period. Uh, you know, even though painting, taking paintings was a very small portion of what the Nazis did, it, how is it possible that, at a, that a minister of education can make that type of mistake? The government committee found in favor of the Belvedere Gallery, and Minister Goerer endorsed their decision. I think Minister Goerer was uh, convinced that Austria has got the right to keep the pictures. She didn't look at any other possibility. She just thought this is the way uh, it has been handled in the past and the law is on our side and why should we give the pictures back? Because in the will of uh, Adele Blochbauer it said uh, it, the pictures should actually be given to the Belvedere Gallery after her death. The five disputed paintings were part of the largest collection of Klimt's in the world. The Belvedere had a total of 25 on show. They were national icons. Some said the portrait of Adele meant as much to Austrians as the Mona Lisa did to the French. Klimt was an Austrian painter portraying his native countryside and the people of Vienna. For any tourist, the Klimt collection was one of the must-sees on their visit, adding huge amounts to the Austrian economy. I wrote them the nicest letters. I told them that I don't want to take those paintings away from Austria. But um, we have an English proverb I wrote in German that is saying, where there's a will, there's a way. And if you want to work with me, we can find a way that the paintings remain there. They never even bothered to answer the letter. After Minister Goerer had blocked any further discussion over the restitution of the five Blockbauer Klimts, Randy wrote to her directly, saying in all fairness, she should consider arbitration. And her response to me was, in writing, uh, if you don't like the way we've dealt with the law, you have to go to court. The Austrians must have felt confident that Randy and Maria wouldn't sue in Austria, as Maria would have to put down a large deposit reflecting the value of the painting. But they hadn't bargained for the tenacity of the American lawyer. In this case, it would have been almost several million dollars for Maria just to initiate a lawsuit. So we tried to reduce that, and the, and the judge said, well, yes, Maria Altman, you don't have to pay more than all everything you own. You just have to pay everything you own. And literally all of her assets other than her, than her home, she would have had to pay to start the litigation in Austria. And then Austria appealed and said the amount should be even higher than that. So at that point, <laughs> let's forget about suing in Austria. Let's see if we can sue in the United States. That was something Austria never thought possible. If Randy couldn't fight them in Vienna, he would fight them in his hometown, Los Angeles. Randy needed to bring pressure to bear on the case. He got to work making sure that the world knew about the injustices inflicted on the Blockbauer family. One of the papers he turned to was the Los Angeles Times. I went over to Randall's office to meet the lawyer. He was in his early 30s. He looked like he just graduated from college. He was pacing around the office and pulling books out of bookshelves, showing me pictures, spreading things out like characters from a Russian novel. And um, I remember standing there thinking, huh, uh, this, this is a kind of case that's untested. I mean, I wouldn't say I thought it was a lost cause, but I certainly thought it was a case for which there was no legal precedent in the United States. But how could he sue Austria? He searched and searched for a way, 
Then he found that if he could prove that Austria made money out of the Klimt paintings in the U.S., he might have a chance. And Austria, of course, had cashed in on posters and books about the artist. I thought, I think we can file a lawsuit here in Los Angeles. Maria Altman's been a citizen here for 60 years. She should have the right to have her courts decide this legal issue between her and Austria. So I filed the complaint in August of 2000, and it didn't cost $2 million to file the complaint. It cost a few hundred. I think people thought it was sort of a quixotic effort, you know, that I was tilting at windmills and, and, you know, to take on the Austrian government and sue in the United States to try to get back paintings that were in Vienna seemed a little bit nuts, I must say. And I think most people uh, who were looking at it thought I was a little bit crazy. But when I won the district court, people started taking a little more notice. But, you know, crazy things happen in the district court. It'll get corrected on appeal. Uh, but when I won in the court of appeal, then people started to really pay attention to the case. Six years after taking on the case, Randy's determination took him before the judges of the Supreme Court. The Austrian government had the resources to fight the case all the way to the highest court in America. Very few cases go to the Supreme Court, just about 80 cases per year, and so very rare that you'd get a private litigation like this going to the Supreme Court, and you know, you can count on, on a few hands the number of people in Los Angeles who get to, get to do that type of thing. But as the date for the Supreme Court hearing grew nearer, Randy found he wouldn't just be fighting the Austrians. A number of other countries, including the Bush administration, wrote legal briefs uh, basically supporting Austria's contention that the case shouldn't go forward in U.S. courts, that the U.S. was not the proper jurisdiction. Many countries don't want to see themselves in the same position where they're being sued in a foreign court over in a historic grievance that's 50 years old. I think probably many U.S. judges don't want to see those kinds of cases uh, regularly in U.S. courts. Um, so. Basically, when he went to go argue against the argue against Austria in the U.S. Supreme Court, the Bush administration had already cast a vote that was supportive of Austria. On February 25th, 2004, Randy finally had the chance to take on both the Austrian and his own government before the Supreme Court. He's not a big guy, you know. And there's this huge room uh, of the courtroom, you know. And there the, on this podium sat the judges. And then little Randy walked up there, you know. But Randy was desperate not to be overawed by the occasion. I went up last after the U.S. government and the Austrian government argued. And so I got up, and you don't prepare a speech in the Supreme Court because they always interrupt you. So yeah, I just had a general outline of what I wanted to say, and I said, there are four grounds for affirming the Ninth Circuit. Ground one is, and then boom, I got interrupt interrupted by Justice Souter. And he asked me this long, long question, convoluted, twisting and turning question, da 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 like that. And all of a sudden, the question was over, and he's looking at me, and I had not the slightest idea what he had just asked me. Not, not a clue. All I could think of saying was, I, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, I, I don't think I understood the question. Could you please rephrase it? And, and there were these gasps in the audience, you know. And, but the other justices were so nice, they all smiled as if to say, oh, don't worry, he does that all the time. Or, you know, thank goodness you asked because we didn't understand it either. It was a turning point. Far from being a blunder, Randy had succeeded in endearing himself to the court. That opened everything for him because all the other judges smiled. From that moment, he had the judges on his side. It must have had a good impact, and it just seemed really, at the end of it, it seemed like we had a chance of winning, which was a big surprise. And so I just floated out of the room, and I was so happy, and everybody congratulated me. The room was filled with men, all lawyers. They came running up to me and they said, 
Maria, it looks fabulous. And I said, how oh, can you tell? Nobody said anything. Randy flew back to Los Angeles, uncertain whether he had won or lost. No sooner had he arrived than he got some bad news. I got home and I opened up the legal newspaper here in Los Angeles and the headline was, Court likely to revert Al reverse Altman case. That we were going to lose. And, and so I called up the reporter and I said, you know, how could you say this? Everybody thought it went so well. And he said, trust me. I've been reporting the Supreme Court for 35 years. You don't stand a chance. It's all over. And I said, well, you know, some of the justices didn't even open their mouths. He says, I can tell by the body language. You lost. It was the spring when the case was heard in Washington. But it was the fall in Los Angeles when Randy finally learned the result. Three months later, I'm making breakfast for the kids, and I get this call from the reporter. He says, hello, this is Dave Pike. And I said, OK, well, give me the bad news. He said, no, not bad news. You won. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, 6-3 decision by Justice Stevens. I, I literally couldn't believe it. And, but it was coming from him. I had to believe it. And so, you know, I tried to call Maria, and her phone was busy, and then we finally got together. And just, I mean, the celebration was enormous. But very quickly we realized, wait a second, what did we just win? Nothing, right? All we won was the right to start the case in Los Angeles. The paintings are still in Vienna. We hadn't won anything. We just won the right to start. It may have been just the beginning for Randy, but the judgment put the Austrian government in a difficult position. They may have been anxious to throw off their Nazi past, but now the case had attracted media interest from around the world. Now the U.S. Supreme Court had basically weighed in and said, OK, well, you can hear it in U.S. court. U.S. courts tend to be more favorable in these cases. However, the Austrians could have appealed, as they had appealed some of the other decisions in the past. But to have this dragging on in the public view uh, during these appeals uh, as an issue that really, at this point, was not going to go away, I think was a very difficult quandary for the Austrians. But it wasn't just the Austrian government that was in a precarious position. Randy's client was now 89. Could he risk a lengthy court case? If she died, his case was over. She had no other relatives living in the United States who could continue the case. It took a year of negotiations, but eventually both sides agreed to a do-or-die arbitration. I went behind closed doors with Maria and I said, Maria, this is the greatest thing. We can have this arbitration. We can get it finally finished, and by your 90th birthday next February, it'll all be over with, and isn't that great? And she said, are you crazy? Why on earth would we go back to Austria when we've just been fighting for five years, all the way to the Supreme Court and back, to have the right to, uh, to try the case in front of this wonderful judge here in Los Angeles? I said, you're crazy. Why would three Austrian arbitrators go against their government and give us the paintings when for eight years they kept saying. And he said, we have to take the chance. Having convinced Maria, Randy flew to Vienna. The game was on. He was going to gamble everything. The Klimts were probably worth over a hundred million dollars. Who had the strongest hand? Randall was very skillful at uh, getting his side of the story out. I think he was more skillful uh, than the Austrians in articulating his position in the media. So when the panel was deciding this case, it was another period of months and months that went by where they were still in this limbo. And you kind of thought anything could happen. Once again, Randy had no idea whether he had won or lost. He returned to Los Angeles. Then four months later, he got an email message. I came home late one night from a neighborhood poker game where I had lost my shirt and uh, uh, checked my email. And sure enough, there's an email from the, the main arbitrator with the decision. And so I opened up the, the decision, and it's all in German, you know, and, and my German's pretty good, but it took me a while until I got to the, you know, the part where they said we won. 
and it was I was you know obviously overjoyed, but it was like midnight. It was after midnight uh, on a Sunday night, Monday morning. So I didn't call Maria right away. I let her sleep, and uh, and then in the morning we really cel. This time we really celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very exciting. I did not expect it. I was hoping, but I, because I couldn't imagine, and I still think it is incredibly just that these three Austrian judges unanimously vote for something which their government was so totally against. Nobody in Austria thought this could happen. They were shell-shocked. These paintings were national icons. I think it was a wise decision, but it came too late. Of course, Klimt is national cultural heritage of Austria, and, and his paintings are famous and we're proud of them. And he is Austrian, and uh, he wanted them to stay in Austria. So Austria needed to find a solution, a diplomatic solution, and uh, they knew they're going to be watched internationally on how, to, uh, how they will handle this case. It could have been done smarter. It's done now, but it could have been done smarter and the damage could have been uh, less. I think you cannot take a better example for the style of Klimt than to compare the Adele Blochbauer 1 with Adele Blochbauer 2. I mean, we are very sad that from uh, now on, we do not have this possibility anymore in our museum. And this is very sad because this was such a fascinating comparison, which is so unique. Because you see not only the same person, only five years are in between these two portraits, but you see also the change of style, which is in this short period. When finally the decision was made uh, that the pictures would leave Austria, there was a national outcry. There was lots of criticism and I was like, why do we have to give the pictures away? Why couldn't you find another way of, uh, of handling this matter, of, of, of buying the pictures, you know, because everybody thought we would have enough money to get at least one of the pictures back or two. But uh, that wasn't the case, so a lot of people felt sad and felt about a missed chance and so many people um, stormed, <laughs> not stormed, but so many people went to the gallery to have a last look at, at, at the Klimt pictures. One aspect on the Austrian side is, um, is a certain lack of, of coordination in this case, or maybe a lack of leadership. So I, I don't think they had a, a, a plan A, so they did not need, a, need a, a plan B. This story began in 1938 with the Nazis looting the Blachbau Klimts in Vienna. The paintings were locked in Austria for 68 years. For the first time since they were looted, they were leaving Vienna. On the 24th of April, 2006, the paintings arrived in the city where Maria lives. They went on display at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for one of the most popular exhibitions ever held there. When Maria first walked in and saw the paintings here, first of all, she said, they look so much bigger here. And I think it was very, it was wonderful for her to be able to have them here in Los Angeles where she settled, where she, you know, raised her family to be able to share them with her family. And we also have a great collection in the city of German and Austrian art um, of this period, so it would have had a, a marvelous context as well. This was the final victory for Maria. But far from keeping them as a family heirloom, she decided to sell them. They weren't destined to stay in the Los Angeles gallery. They were on the move again, this time to New York. Wealthy collectors from all over the world were heading to Rockefeller Center. The Klimts were going up for auction. There's been a lot of interest. They've been on view for the past four days and we've had record figures through. Three, four times the number of people who normally come through our exhibition rooms have been arriving. Um, so I think from that we can gauge that there's strong interest. But after the long legal battles, why had Maria decided to sell? It seems the main consideration was security. How could Maria protect them? These paintings now have become so valuable that the heirs really don't have the, didn't have the ability to keep them themselves. And this is really a way for 
for Ferdinand and Adela's heirs to um, to transform this inheritance into something that they can actually use for other good purposes. And I know that that they all have really terrific things that they're going to be doing with the money for it. So I, I hope the, the sale goes well and that they, they find good homes. And it doesn't bother me necessarily if they go into private collections. These were, after all, private property. Uh, and it's only because of the, this history that they were in the Austrian Museum for so many decades. But uh, they belonged to Ferdinand Blochbauer, and he willed them to his family. And now, just like any inheritance, whether it be stock or cash, paintings or whatever, uh, they're entitled to, to do with it what they want. You so seldom see pictures of this quality come to the market and have four at one time is, is something very special indeed. I think each picture has its own particular facets that will attract different clients um, and their general importance is something that has been recognised by collectors far and wide. Maria had struggled for a lifetime to get the paintings back and only owned them for a few months. Did she have any regrets about not leaving them together in Vienna? Well, I mean, uh, I wasn't willing to donate it because I think the Belvedere had the paintings for 68 years and there was no reason to make a donation after that but he could negotiate just like everybody else will do. Maria Altman didn't even want the pictures, and she didn't want them for her living room. She wanted them actually to stay in Austria, but she couldn't find another way to do it. And she said, look, if you want to buy the pictures, fair enough. If you don't, we're going to take them. Not only was the Christie's auction room packed, but there were international bids coming in by telephone. The first painting up was Klimt's The Birch Forest, and still bidder, 36 million. At 36 million dollars, all done and selling right at 36 million dollars. Mark, your bidder at 36 million. The second Klimt, the Atazé landscape there, lot 52 was illustrated in your catalogues. At 28 million dollars, it's still up front against you here and selling this time, all done at 28 million dollars. For you, madam, 28 million dollars. Lot 53 is the third Klimt, apple tree number one, at 29,500,000. 29,500,000, selling this side for 29,500,000. Not 54, the fourth Klimt there, portrait of Adele Blochbauer II, it's the 1912 portrait, 65 million, $67 million, $67,500,000. At $68 million, it was down to two bidders. How far would they go? $70 million, $500,000. $71 million, $72 million, $73 million. But just when the hammer was about to fall... $74 million, new bidder. <laughs> That's $74 million. New bidder at 74 million, 75 million, 76 million, 77 million, 77 million 500,000, 78 million, 78 million 500,000, at 78 million 500,000 dollars on this telephone, fair warning and selling, all done at 78 million 500,000. Guy, your bidder at 78 million dollars, 500,000. It felt tremendous. There was there was sort of an energy in the room when the paintings came up that I think was a response to the story itself, the the, the background of the pictures, not just the, the pictures as art. And I, I felt that electricity in the air. I was sitting there. That, at least that's how it felt to me. The three Klimts had raised a staggering one hundred and seventy-two million dollars. Where they are now is a mystery. Christie's is not saying who the buyers are. But where was the most famous painting of all? The gold portrait of Adele. This painting was meant to be auctioned with the others, but it never came up for sale. It had been sold three months earlier for a record-breaking $135 million to Ronald Lauder, the head of the perfume empire. When Ronald Lauder was in Vienna, 
uh, and he saw that painting. He said he never forgot it. Of course, he'd already seen reproductions of it before. And I think that Lauder's reaction was similar to everyone's reaction, including my own, which was uh, when I saw a picture of the painting that, that was under discussion, my first reaction was, oh, that painting. And I think everyone has pretty much the same reaction. Lauder himself put it this way. As a 14-year-old boy, he had walked across to the Belvedere one morning. Nothing prepared me for how it looked. It was something that symbolizes so many things to me. It was just me traveling without my parents. It symbolizes that moment of my growing up. Perhaps the greatest irony of this art heist is this. The paintings Hitler and Goering took from the Blockbauer's collection and considered so valuable faded into obscurity. The ones the Nazis viewed as insignificant and simply sold off became the major treasures of the 20th century, and Adele Blockbauer's image came to be known all over the world.